So yeah, today we want to talk through um, our journey so far in using Capella to support the conceptual design of a fusion power plant. Um, we've already been introduced, so I won't I won't bother talking through that again. So in our presentation today, um, I'll introduce the project that we're working on called Step. Um, before providing an overview of our MBSE methodology adopted. Then Yitong will explore in a little more detail the model that we're creating and how it supports some of our systems engineering processes. You'll see from our model status and the presentation in general that there's still a lot of work to do. And so we're finished by discussing some of the challenges face and where we see our next steps. So I wanted to start by sharing some of the context of our MBSE work. We're applying it in a project called STEP, and this stands for Spherical Tokamak for Energy Production. Uh, and in the next few slides, I will talk a little bit about the motivation behind the project, uh, what it seeks to deliver, and when. So starting with motivation, I guess with the recent COP26 conference, I'm sure that graphs like this will be very familiar to you. I think we all know that climate change is real, and over the last few years, the impact of it is becoming increasingly evident. Um, addressing climate change has profound implications for the world's energy use. There are about, I don't know, roughly 11,000 days to 2050, um, the UK target for achieving net zero, and globally about 11,000 megatons of oil equivalent to displace. So this equates to, I'm told, about one nuclear power station per day, or the largest offshore wind farm in the world per day, every day for 30 years. So it's a big, big challenge. Let's go to the next slide, Yitong. So before I'm um, going into that too far though, I thought I'd better say quickly what um, fusion energy is for those that, that aren't sure. So the fusion reaction, and you can see one on the top of the screen here, in the reaction, uh, energy is released when two light nuclei are fused to form a heavier atom. And this is the process that powers the sun and other stars. To achieve fusion, the fuel must be heated to extreme temperatures, about 15 million degrees Celsius in the center of the sun. Here on Earth, the most efficient reaction is that between two isotopes of hydrogen. So you can see deuterium and tritium, uh, which only fuse at temperatures of over 100 million degrees Celsius. So at these temperatures, the fuel becomes a plasma. And you can kind of see the, the apparatus or the, or the setup roughly in the diagram below. So the fusion plasma is heated and it's confined in a ring-shaped bottle known as a tokamak, where it's controlled with strong magnetic fields. Uh, this heat energy is then extracted to generate electricity in a relatively conventional way. Um, and fusion offers a number of advantages, including a plentiful supply of fuel um, lasting for many thousands of years no production of greenhouse gases from the fusion process, uh, less long-lived radioactive waste than nuclear fission, and inherent safety features. So that's a bit about fusion. If we move on to the next slide now. Are we there? Cool. So, um, and the UK government is strongly backing fusion energy as one of the ways to potentially address the climate change problem. And we've seen some significant investment here at UKA in support generally, and particularly for the STEP project, which we're talking about today. So next slide. So that's broadly the why behind the project. And um, here's, here's some of the what. So STEP has a mission to deliver a UK prototype fusion energy plant targeting 2040 and a path to commercial viability of fusion. So if we, on the next slide, break that down a little bit, here's some of the deliverables that we're committed to, to delivering. In essence, we have to build a mega program design and delivery capability, deliver a device, prove it works, and create the demand. And then we must have the capability ready to support that demand. Um, you'll see on this list terms like digital twin, fully documented safety case, where we believe that 
the MBSE work we're doing can be really relevant. And on the next slide, here's, here's a kind of a high level schedule of uh, those deliverables over the life of the project. Um, our nearest goal is to deliver a concept design by 2024 with commissioning and operations from around 2040. So finally, in terms of kind of setting the scene, I wanted to acknowledge that STEP is building on the successes of many other projects and working alongside complementary projects, including ITER and DEMO, which some of you may have already heard of. Okay, so um, if we move now to the methodology. So hopefully having given a bit of context, um, and I want to talk a little bit about our MBSE approach so far. Can we, is there a delay on the slides? Can we skip two slides? Yeah. Is it frozen? That'd be a slight frozen with a presentation. I can, have, I can talk through it. Yeah. So what I was going to show, there's a slide that, that we showed at the beginning or near the beginning of our work with Capella, and its intention was to sell some of the, the benefits to the project of what we were intending to do. Uh, and there's a number of things listed on there. The first one being communication. Um, so the STEP team has grown very rapidly with new starters like every week. And on top of that, we're engaging increasingly with external partners and suppliers. So one of the things the model can help us with is by providing a reference for people to hopefully develop quite a quick understanding of the power plant and its context. Um, other benefits you can see here are around interface management, requirements development. And these are things that Yitong would talk a little bit more about later in the presentation. And the final one here is around information management. We're seeking to adopt a product-centric information architecture in step built around but information built around breakdown structures generated in Capella, uh, for example, the logical and physical breakdown structures. So those those are kind of the benefits that we sold this on. I'm sure there are many more. If we move now to our approach on the next slide. Is that oh, perfect? Um, so this this graph. A graphic broadly shows our approach in applying the Arcadia method. The curve isn't great, but hopefully illustrates that we're adopting a kind of a top-down iterative approach through the different layers. Um, in the first iteration, we stepped quickly through the first two layers and concentrated on the logical architecture layer. I guess one of the reasons for this is that we're working on a brownfield site. Whilst the fusion power plant would be a first of a kind, a lot of thought has already gone into fusion reactors with two existing experimental reactors on site, JET and MAST. So people have come to step with a basic idea of what a fusion power plant should look like. So our focus has been to work with them at this level and try and capture and sometimes challenge the thinking uh, at a logical architecture layer. And through this, we hope to gain traction quickly um, with the project and the MBSC work that we're doing. But we're now reaching a point, as you can see with this red dot, where we want to return to the operational system analysis layers, expanding them and linking them through to the logical layer in an effort to kind of validate some of what we've already expressed in the logical layer or, or challenge some of it. And we're also starting to explore how we capture the physical architecture. So before handing over to Itong, I just wanted to quickly highlight some of the aspects of our approach that have proved helpful so far. The first was seeking to adopt a kind of sprint-based approach where we would agree a specific goal in terms of model development over a period of several weeks. And at the end of the period, we would demonstrate what had been done to interested stakeholders. This helped to generate pace in our work and keep others interested in what we were doing. I guess on the second point, it probably goes without saying that engaging with those in a project who have the domain knowledge is critical. We've embedded Capella modelers or systems engineers in each of the project teams to help facilitate capture of information from them. In the longer term, it's our hope that people will start to engage more with the model directly. And finally, I just wanted to pay tribute to the Capella community who we found very helpful in supporting the work that we're doing here. Um, for example, Sebastian at Samaras has been really helpful at providing some mentoring in our work. So that, that's a fairly high level run through. It's going to hand over to Isong now to talk through um, a bit more detail around the model and what we've done. 
Great. Thank you, Jason. I will now go through how our NBSC methodology is implemented using the Capella tool and provide you with a brief overview of the current model status. So starting with system analysis, as Jason highlighted before, we started off uh, with this layer and the initial focus has been analysing sort of key system missions and capabilities by conducting a needs, goals and objectives analysis on, on the step prototype plant, which is our system of interest here. And then we analyse the system missions to realise them into functional chains. This is then allocated to our system of interest and the surrounding actors to help define the scope of the step prototype plant um, to uh, describe what's in and out of the system. We have also described the initial system mode and state machine diagrams as well. This then allows us to move down to the logical architecture. So this is an example logical architecture view of the functional chain on exporting net electrical power. So the logical architecture has been the majority of our modeling efforts thing. And so in this case, the, the functional chain from a system layer was brought down to a logical layer to be further refined into lower level functions, influenced by the technical solution we're developing. And this view describes the exporting of net electrical power, so starting from the initial fusion fuel supply to generating the fusion reactions and then harnessing the fusion energy and converting that to electricity before exporting to the grid. So we're using this top-down analysis um, has been our main method um, on elaborating from functional chains. We have also adopted a more of a bottom-up approach in uh, developing the logical architecture, and that has been mainly been working with the technical experts and domain experts to elicit um, the system functions and behaviours. So there's a mix of top-down and bottom-up approach used. Then we sort of went back to up to the operational analysis, and this kind of occurred slightly retrospectively because this stakeholder engagement is still ongoing on the project. So we're using more of an iterative approach between the various layers. And there's a need to kind of transition uh, back down to the system layer using the uh, operational analysis performed. And this layer we found so far being very helpful um, in terms of analyzing the context around the step prototype plant and understanding uh, the surrounding users. So it's provide good insight into business case around why the need for a fusion power plant right now um, is intended to use to put energy onto the grid and also the second capability of supplying the surplus rare fuel uh, tritium for future fusion power plants. I will then move on to the physical architecture. So this has so far uh, been the least mature layer in our model uh, and this is kind of um, evident because the, a lot of the technologies are still in selection and we're starting to refine uh, the concept as the design decisions are being made. To summarise, I'm um, providing some model metrics here, so um, currently for the system and the logical layers, since that's where the modelling efforts have been so far been focused on. Uh, there are two key insights um, I can draw. So first one is there is a large number of system and logical functions and as well as a large number of logical components. So indicating this is quite a complex system. The second insight is in terms of the relatively no, low number of system missions and functional chains. So this means we can further improve um, on the top down approach by take on more missions and capabilities as system layer and translate them to functional chains and then um, propagate to logical layer. Further on explaining what are we doing with requirements. So, so far we have been using the open source add-on requirements viewpoint uh, to link the model elements, which describes how does the system work to the textual requirements, which describes what it needs to do. Um, and so far we found Capella modeling has helped in eliciting requirements. So using model functions to express functional requirements as well as PVMT to express non-functional requirements and the 
the Arcadian method has been very useful to help establish the traceability from stakeholder objectives to um, low level component requirements all the way down to physical architecture. We're currently exploring the option to use the model entirely as a single source of truth to express our requirements and export them into textual requirements if needed. And there's the obvious benefit um, on the simplicity of using a single tool to manage both our model and requirements. But there is the ongoing challenge we are currently evaluating on whether the requirements viewpoint add-on is capable of coping with and managing a large number of requirements uh, for a complex system like STEP. So Jason has mentioned we are also using MBSE to help with our interface management. So the approach has been uh, creating an M2Doc template, and this was developed in conjunction by our Pella mentor, Samaris Engineering. And M2Doc add-on is then used to extract information from the model and export into interface control documents. And we are also using PVMT to represent characteristics across the interfaces. So alongside the obvious benefit of ensuring consistency between various systems, um, since currently so far only system engineers on the STEP pro project have got editing access to Capella, this has also allowed engagement with non-modelers and domain experts across the program as a means of using documents for them to provide feedback onto the model. Last thing, we have also found Capella quite an Arcadian methodology quite helpful in terms of um, managing expectations um, on the design process. So on step, we're adopting the concept maturity level metrics uh, originally from NASA to kind of guide the expectations of the maturity of the system design concept. And we found that the Arcadian methodology broadly aligns with the CML methodology. So starting from the initial definition of the problem space um, from an initial idea, um, which is the focus of CML 1 to 2, and that aligns broadly with the system layer and some of the operational analysis layer. And then moving on to exploring different solution options and understanding the, pro uh, the solution space and selecting a concept and that broadly aligns with CML 3 to 5. So currently step is at CML3 where we're exploring, uh, we're freezing the concept space and um, are looking to narrow down our solution into one concept. So that was the uh, brief overview on the current model status. I'll kind of now move on to some of the key challenges we're facing um, implementing MBSC uh, tool on the program. So I've briefly touched on before, since we are concept phase and the unique feature is currently being evaluating many different architectural options and those need to generate different options and evaluating them, um, allowing the need to kind of tra uh, tracing all the various variant models back to a single architecture. And we have explored a number of options so far on performing their modeling, so including pure variants fragmentation and system to subsystem transitions. And we haven't yet found a perfect way to do variant modeling yet. So currently the trade up amount, and this is partly due to um, the lack of tools we have to link to from MBSC to simulation. So currently the trade up analysis occurs outside of the tool and we've been using MBSC model to help the team understand the context around different design decisions and capturing the results of the decisions made. So further elaborating on other challenges we face and sort of learnings uh, we have uh, gained since our journey so far. First one is in terms of uh, engagement uh, with the rest of the programme in terms of articulating the benefit of the MBSC and convincing people um, and also the challenge in terms of um, helping people to focus more on the problem space instead of jumping to the solutions um, at this stage in the concept uh, phase. And also briefly touched on before, we've been adopting more of a middle out approach um, by combining, 
com combining top down and bottom up, whereas we found that Arcadian method traditionally accommodates more of a top down approach. So the transition from bottom to top layers is a manual process. Uh, we've also kind of struggled, but also learned a lot from uh, the various Arcadian method uh, layers and understanding to what level abstraction and to what level detail should the architecture be captured at the logical versus physical architecture layers. And the last point was more to do with change management, since we're working in a large team of uh, systems engineers on the same model using Team for Capella. Um, if a change was made on a particular part of the model, this propagates to all the other representations. So this requires some formatting, reformatting of our diagrams, which could take a significant amount of our modeling time. So that was a brief overview of the challenges and the model status. I'll now hand over to Jason to talk about next steps and conclude the presentation. Thanks, Ita. Um, so to finish then, I just want to briefly highlight some of our future work. There's more, more than we're showing here, obviously. I mean, I think most of the points mentioned here have been referenced already in the presentation, so I don't need to spend, intend to spend too long on this. Um, as mentioned, we're seeking to iterate through the top-down process again. Whilst we've been working in the logical layer, significant stakeholder engagement has taken place, and we want to help capture and structure some of that. We also, as Itong mentioned, want to start moving into the physical architecture le level to explore what that looks like for us. Um, we're keen to capture more around maintenance and control concepts, as well as starting to link with safety, for example, through functional M FMEAs or FTAs. Um, so far in our work, I think it's fair to say most of the modeling effort has been around capturing decisions. This has proven useful for some of the reasons that we've already mentioned. But we're keen to move beyond this and start using the model to help support and drive decision making. Now that we have something to show, our expectation is that this will become easier as we engage with teams. Um, and in referring to expected benefits at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned how it could support creation of an information architecture in step. We intend to continue this work and in the medium term seek to embed this information architecture into a PLM system. And finally, I think as Yitong said, as you'd expect in a project like this, many different analytical models and simulations are used. And in time, we'd like to explore ways of linking these with our Capella model. So those are just some of the tasks that we've got coming up. We've got to the final slide. So that's that's kind of all from Yitong and me. Um, we'd like to leave you with this quote from Stephen Hawking. Um, I won't, I won't read it out, but you don't have to take it from us that this is important work that Capella is helping to enable. So thank you very much for, for listening to our presentation. Um, and we're really keen to, to sort of engage with others on this. So any comments or insights that you have to offer, I really appreciate it. Thank you much. Okay, first, uh, first question. Why did you select Capella Acadia as opposed to other methods and tools? Yeah, it's a good question. We did explore a range of tools and i think historically in the organization we've used enterprise architect um, and sysml as a way of doing this i think one of the appeals of the capella method was a bit more information around the methodology and it gave us something more concrete to be working with and we felt that engineers on the project could more easily engage with it i don't know Tom, do you have anything to add to that uh, yes exactly i think most of two um the reason why we selected Capella is we were looking for a, a tool with a solid framework and method behind it. And we also completed um, sort of an internal assessment between Capella and Magic Tool and overall selected um, uh, Capella. Um, but I think both tools have got pros and cons. Did you consider trying to model the program required to deliver a reactor and not just the, just, I like to just, not just the reactor? I think it's a good question i mean in many ways the program required to deliver it is almost as complex as the reactor itself um, and we were starting from scratch with a lot of this you know step had to develop as an organization alongside starting to develop the um the product i guess in terms of using an mbse approach to design a program 
we did toy with some concepts using enterprise architect at the beginning but it didn't gain much traction so we, did, we didn't press ahead with that too far i think we found and maybe i'd be interested in other people's experience on this but it felt like that the kapala method lent itself more to developing a kind of a technical system as opposed to kind of a enterprise type system but, but i'd be happy to be proven wrong on that and in fact we have started to at the operation analysis layer lay out some of the actors involved in this delivery program and start to to capture some of the requirements against each that's been quite a useful thing for us excellent have you used pvmt to model um just non-functional constraint or all non-functional constructing requirements um so in terms of PVMT, we have been using them solely on non-functional um, sort of requirements to describe property values on interfaces and some of the technical metrics. Uh, we've also actually explored PVMT to um, sort of manage team ownerships of various systems. So we assigned different logical components to different teams on the STEP program. I hope that answers the question. Well, it's a, it's an answer anyway. <laughs> Maybe if if people have as additional questions, they can connect you and and exchange directly. Uh, um, next one, with the support of interface management in place, um, how was the link to configuration management organized? That's, that's a good question. I think as we're relatively early in the project and lots of different concepts and technologies are being explored we're probably more flexible and fluid at this stage in the project i think configuration management is something that we're conscious of and something that we're going to have to implement more rigorously going forward so i think the interface documents that we put in place at the moment are mainly for information and to enable people to talk around some of these um exchanges of information um i think we need to think about how we how we use that to control configuration management in the future and that's, that's something we'll come to what was the use and the connectivity with plm uh so there's a number of uses here i suppose one of the things um we want to build our information architecture around is is the product breakdown structure expressed as kind of a logical breakdown structure or the physical breakdown structure and capture all the relevant information that we generate in the project around those kind of real life objects um, and so the work that we're doing in capella helps us to create those breakdown structures which we want to then take and use in our plm system to, to kind of structure the information that we capture in terms of the connectivity we haven't yet procured our plm system so what that connectivity looks like we need to figure out it could be a manual thing that we do Occasionally, or, or more ideally, perhaps we could um, we could have more of an automatic sort of transfer of information between the two. If anyone's got any experience of uh, of doing this, we'd, we'd welcome a kind of another further conversation. Previous speaker mentioned the safety aspect model with uh, Arcade and Capella. Did you use Capella to model safety too? Uh, we haven't yet. We, we've had Aton, do you want to do that step in before you? Um, I don't think we've so far kind of um, linked linked with safety yet, um, but we kind of have explored a particular add-on, which I forgot the name on, is to use the architecture to link with some of the safety analysis. Um, but I don't think any work has started so far. It could be. I mean, what's starting to be useful is using some of the diagrams that we're producing in Kapala and sitting down with the safety team to help frame some of the safety work that they're doing. So there's a, a kind of a communications piece that's useful for us, but I think we want to go a bit deeper than that and start to, yeah, link the model with some of these safety tools. And then we've got opportunities to do that. I think the safety team are quite keen to, to kind of get involved with that. So maybe we could come back next year and talk a little bit more about what we've done in that, that field. Okay, which criteria did you use to distinguish um... In terms of blocks and inter interface definition, what should be in the logical and physical architectures? I think that's a great question. We've really struggled. I think we, um, because most of the project talks in terms of physical architecture and physical things, we, we've often 
to, to kind of speak the same language drifted into expressing the logical architecture in more of a physical way. And we've had to kind of draw back from that quite frequently. Um, I think that what, what we'll find is if we go down into the physical architecture, we'll start to understand that that interface a little bit better. So if we start to express things in the physical architecture, and that's exactly the same as our logical architecture, then um, we might want to revisit how we've expressed some of the logical architecture. We, I mean, we've called the elements, the blocks within our logical architecture, systems, uh, sort of behavioral systems, when the title ends with system. And perhaps with hindsight, we should maybe have dropped the term system and just describe the behavior for the block. And that might help people to think less physically. So that's something that we need to go back and have a, have a look at. I guess the other thing that we wanted to do quite early on, but didn't really get onto and only considering now is to take a thin slice through the model. So working from top to bottom on a particular aspect, and that might help us to work through the different interfaces. But um, yeah, that's, that's a work in progress for us. Where did you manage requirements? So probably it's an opportunity to, to clarify something. Where, where do we manage requirements? Or did we, sorry, before where we started using you, Capella? Well, probably, yes, there is a mis misunderstanding about what is a requirement and things like yeah. that. So we, um, historically in the organization, we've managed it in DOORS database. Um, within STEP, like our first approach was to adopt DOORS. We, we did find those actually, whilst that was great for capturing it and the kind of version control and all this kind of thing, we were struggling to engage with the project um, to kind of feed into that and to have access to it. So we, we took a little bit of a step back and we started doing just a bit more informally during our information and our requirements gathering process using simple tools like Excel um, with a view to, to moving to something more formal sort of later on. Um, but increasingly, I think we're finding that the model's offering a lot of capabilities around capturing requirements. So that's where we're looking at now. I think it's still an open question about whether we export from that into doors and use doors going forward, or, or whether we just do it in in Capella in the future. You showed me model metrics. Uh, what do you use it for? Do you want to take that one? Yes, yeah, so we haven't really actually used model metrics that often um, until this time when we just prepare for the Capella Day's uh, presentation, but we've actually found it really useful to kind of draw some key insights on where have been, um, perhaps some parts of the model have been missed or um, kind of draw more insights on where our focus should be and providing feedback. So I think it's certainly something we'll kind of use more in the future to kind of um, understand where we are with the with the model and where are the gaps.